Hello folks, welcome to another video in the 172nd Fighter Wing YouTube channel. 
Uh, thank you for stopping by and taking a look at a couple of, I think, really neat F-14s today. Um, the first one in the foreground is the Hobby Master uh, F-14 Tomcat. This is of the Iranian Serial 3-6049 as shown in the 2014 um, Iranian Air Force Open House. Uh, this is in the Splinter Camo. It was one of the, I believe it was two, that were refurbished by the Iranian Air Force uh, that year. The one to the back over here is going to be the uh, 1980s uh, serial 3-6079. That one is made by a relative newcomer to the 172nd modeling space, Caliber Wings. Uh, you may have seen my video on their F-14 Tom Katsky. This one in the back here is uh, a version of Caliber's F-14 in the original 1980 Splinter, or I should say, um, regular camouflage. Uh, this is the color scheme that I believe every F-14 shipped out of uh, the U.S. with before they were repainted in various colors afterwards as the years went on. So as you're probably familiar, um, I generally will do uh, some background around the history of the model I'm reviewing, and I firmly believe that um, you know models mean something, just like monuments mean something. And when you have a model, I think you know when I have a model on my desk, I like to think that it commemorates the story of that aircraft, not just you know oh it's an F-14 or an F-15 or an F. 100 or what have you, um, but I think it's important that the model symbolizes the the efforts of people, right? Because it took a lot of people to make the F-14 a real thing, right? So in a way, I feel like my models pay tribute to that. Um, that's just my perspective, but um, I'd be interested to hear if you agree with that idea or not. Hopefully you do, because you're probably watching this, right? So um, under the assumption that you're watching this of your own free will, um, you know, I would think that you probably agree, but hey, it's what the comment section's for, right? So, in any event, let's talk about the aircraft. Um, we're gonna go to some history. I say some history, and I wanna make a disclaimer right here that I'm going to be leaving some things out. Um, it was pretty clear to me that I was going to be dealing with a lot of work in terms of researching the F-14 setup because um, quite frankly, the, the F-14 story is pretty deep and just researching the F-14 in the American service is a bit of a challenge. I mean, it's not as much of a challenge because there are a lot of sources and a lot of media and a certain 1980s movie that I'm not going to mention. So researching the F-14 in U.S. service is relatively easy. Researching it for Iranian service is a bit tougher, or I should say it's substantially tougher. And then you have the geopolitical complication between Iran and the U.S. and, you know, that whole sordid history of the two countries' political interactions since the 1960s. Um, a lot of, um, you know, spy novel, shady stuff happening between both countries in terms of political developments ever since. So I realize this is going to be a pretty uh, deep historical thing to touch on, and it's very difficult to try to capture all of it in a video that's not just insanely, insanely long. And it didn't help that when I researched this, the more I researched, the more I found out about the aircraft and the history, the more stuff I researched on that, the more I found out, and the cycle just repeated until I basically had to just kind of take a moment and um, really just set a, a personal limit to myself to just kind of focus on the aircraft exclusively and to leave out um, what wasn't relevant. And it's tough. It's tough because um, when we're talking about the Iranian F-14, we're not just talking about an airplane. We're talking about almost a cultural icon. Um, and the Iranians are justifiably proud of how they've flown this airplane even now, which is a subject I will get to later. But um, yeah, there's a lot of history here. And uh, that's one of the reasons why this video has come out a little bit later than I've wanted to. And I knew it was going to be tough. I knew this was going to be a very um, 
deep and challenging subject matter to cover. Um, so as is my previous custom with my earlier videos, if you feel that there is an error, please make your voice heard in the comment section or send me a message. I'm certainly welcome to any feedback and new information. I'm not going to presume that I know everything about a certain subject. Um, and my research and my sources may be incorrect on certain things too. So, um, as a fan of airplanes and a fan of history, I'm just going to jump into this and uh, hope you enjoy jumping in with me. So let's begin with something that's kind of interesting. And it's the fact that I came across researching why the Iranians even picked this airplane. Um, so to understand that, we have to kind of take a step back to like the very, very beginning of the F-14 story. So right after the F-14 was essentially adopted by the U.S. military, which was when the F-111B was canceled in 1968. And that, that whole story, the start of the whole TFX thing and the F-111 and how that ties into the F-14, I think I've covered that in my F-111 video. So go ahead and check that one out if you want a briefing of the entire F-14 story from like the very, very beginning. But I'm going to pick this up right about the point where the F-14 has been decided upon by the Navy. So this aircraft for its time was probably the most advanced air-to-air -air aircraft um, ever built in terms of avionics and capability. Um, the AUG-9 radar had multi-track capability. It had a greater than 100 nautical mile reach with the Phoenix missiles, and it could carry six of them in a max loadout configuration. So it was a potent weapon system. It was in an electronic sense, it was the F-22 of its day. And to have Iran in a position to buy these things was, um, well, I kind of have to talk about that too in a bit, because that is part of the beginning of the story as well. So this is going to be hard for people to understand. And I admit it was hard for me to digest researching this, but Essentially, in the 1970s, uh, Iran was in the position that Israel is now in terms of being a great regional ally. Uh, re Israel was an ally at the time, but it was kind of like, you know, they were number two or number three on the list. And number one was the Shah of Iran. OK, um, he was the Western powers bulwark of the region, not just America's friend, but also England's uh, apparently. So in my research of it, it turns out that, um, well, to kind of put things in perspective, uh, apparently Israel was in a position where they were trying to buy F-4 Phantoms, which are, as many of you are aware, one generation behind the F-14, and they were declined, okay? Um, so Iran bought F-14s and the Iran bought F-4s, but Israel tried to get a hold of F-4s and they were initially rebuffed. Um, it took some back channel negotiating involving some captured MiGs from Arab Air Forces to motivate Washington to change their minds. We have to remember this is the, um, around the time that happened, it was the early 1970s. So we were still fighting in Vietnam at that point in time. So there was a heavy interest in getting a hold of any way of finding or acquiring a Soviet MiG for study and, and observation and whatnot. So um, after that, some deals were made and then Israel was able to buy the F-4s, but initially they were rejected for that, which is almost politically unthinkable today. I mean, they actually have F-35s now and they're actually trying to get permission to build and work on them themselves. They're trying to work out a deal, I guess, with, um, with Lockheed Martin to try to have a logistics factory in Israel so they can fix them and take them apart completely and that whole thing. And right now, I think that all the partners have to send their airplanes back to the U.S. for any kind of in-depth work due to the secretive nature of the structure and stealth and all that jazz and the technology. So um, it's kind of, it's a bit of a mind twister if you are um, from, from the U.S. political spectrum to look at where things were back then to realize that Israel wasn't even that high on the allied... Um, association list, I guess if you want to call it that, and that they were below Iran in national importance to U.S. foreign policy, which even as I say that just sounds weird when you think about the modern political situation over there and what the relationship is now between the countries. So 
at that time, okay, Iran was one of the was the biggest ally in the Middle East, and as such, um, the Shah went about evaluating an airplane that could be used for local air superiority. So the rationale here was the Shah had a couple of problems. Um, he was being overflown by uh, MiG 25s that were doing reconnaissance runs, and he needed an aircraft that could put a stop to that. And the MiG 25 was the Russian answer to kind of the, the SR 71. I think it was actually created to stop the XB 70 before it was canceled. And then the Russians were far enough down the pike in terms of work that they just kept, they finished the aircraft. But it was faster than anything else in terms of tactical aviation that could be thrown at it. And the Israelis um, tried several times to take one down with an F-4 and they couldn't do it. Um, so the MiG-25s overflights were a problem. There wasn't anything in the Western inventory besides the F-14 that could take one on and shoot them down. So that capability with the AUG-9 and the long-range missiles um, in the form of the Phoenixes combined with the need for... Iran to defend a large amount of territory, relatively speaking, uh, meant that the F-14s were a more attractive prospect than the F-15A, which at the time had avionics just a little bit more advanced than the F-4, but definitely nothing that would uh, beat the F-14's capability at the time. As I said, it was the F-22 of its day in terms of electronic capability. So... Um, so yeah, so that's where the F-14 comes into the Iranian story, and the um, and and the kind of that decision was made. Let me get my notes here. So that decision was made in 1973. Okay, so 1973 the decision is made, and then in the summer of 1974, the agreements are signed for Grumman to sell a total of 80 F-14s to Iran. Now, while this was going on, a separate drama was happening stateside with the F-14, and that story picks up where the F-111B ended. So in after 1968, the F-111B is canceled, and Grumman moves forward to produce the F-14, which reusing several aspects of the F-111, like the engine and some of the fire control system with the AUG-9 and all those things, um, sped up development considerably. So... Um, Right now, we're looking at the F-35 being in development, I think, almost 20 years, and it's still technically being tested. So um, it's kind of interesting comparing that to the F-14, which went from a sheet of paper to a flying airplane inside of five years. So um, in 1968, the decision was made to go with the F-14. Um, by 1973, uh, they were flying and, and sending deliveries to the Navy. Now, we should note here that even though the Navy had already committed to order these airplanes, Grumman as a company had to shoulder the cost in developing them. And developing the most advanced airplane in the world is a very expensive proposition. So the company was in a couple of places where financially they were in trouble. Um, so Grumman apparently arranged a loan from the U.S. Congress through the Navy, who made the argument that this airplane was so critical to national security that it was worth the U.S. government's trouble to loan Grumman Aerospace money to finish this aircraft. So, quasi-bailout? I don't know. I guess we would probably call that a bailout in modern terms, but again, 1974, things are a little bit different in terms of cultural context. So, Grumman is loaned money to finish the aircraft, and there's some allegations of, um, I, I wouldn't say corruption because of what they did was not technically illegal, but it was definitely shady. Uh, apparently, Grumman, uh, the company management, decided to take some of the money that was supposed to be used to make these F-14s and diverted it to short-term uh, shares on the stock market. So they bought some short-term securities to try to make a profit, and apparently they did, they being Grumman management, and um, the Senate was justifiably not happy about this, which is another cultural aspect that we probably should get used to because, um, you know, today we, we literally have senators that are actually trading themselves on the stock market with knowledge they have about, you know, COVID-19 and things like that. So to, to look back on the 
New York Times article to <laughs> see that the Senate was not happy that Grumman took this loan money and used it to buy shares in the stock market and then posted a profit off that money. I, yeah, it's, it's interesting to read that because now, of course, the Senate probably wouldn't even bat an eye at that sort of behavior. Um, but 1974, different time, different culture, right? So in 1974, late 1974, the Senate's not happy about that. And they suspend the loan um, payments to Grumman. When that happens, that's pretty much a, uh, a blow to the head of the whole program. That's pretty much it. Because right now, the airplanes are still being constructed. And until the aircraft have been delivered, the Navy's not in a position to remit payment. So in August of 1974, the F-14 is effectively canceled at this point. It's been, it well, hasn't been canceled in the sense that somebody has said it is officially canceled but it has certainly been defunded. And at this point in fall of 1974, the program is going to be canceled. So, um, cause there's no money. So Grumman was getting ready to file bankruptcy and that pretty much would have been the end of the company. It would have been the end of the F-14 and it would have been the end of this whole deal. But there was a third player on the board here and that player was Iran. You see, the Shah by this point had already agreed to purchase 80 F-14s, and no matter what, he was going to get his airplanes. So the Shah of Iran orders the state bank of his country to extend a line of credit to Grumman Aerospace to finish building his 80 F-14s. Naturally, the situation of the Navy not being able to fly an airplane that a foreign power already has and has already ordered and taken delivery of, especially when they're the ones that conceived of it, is a situation too absurd even for the absurd people in Congress to tolerate. So after this loan is given to uh, Grumman from the Bank of Iran, the F-14 begins production again and the Navy is able to convince Congress to finish funding the program. So picture for a moment the idea of watching Top Gun and like Tom Cruise flying an F-4 or an F-18, like an old school F-18 Hornet. I mean, that's, um, it's, it's kind of weird even now, to, like in 2021, to see trailers of Top Gun 2 and Tom Cruise is flying a Super Hornet, which don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to throw rocks at Super Hornet fans here. Um, it's, it's a cool plane, it's a capable plane, and it was a certainly necessary replacement for the Tomcat in 2006, but there's just a cachet about Tom Cruise and the F-14 that's undeniable. It's, it's so undeniable, in fact, that um, even in the second movie, in the 2020 Top Gun, they have him supposedly, as I understand the plot right now, the movie is not out yet, but as I understand the plot, he supposedly gets a hold of uh, an F-14, and um, and the only country that has them right now is Iran, so I guess, deductively speaking, he had to have taken one from, from that country, and he flies that airplane in the movie. So it's, it's so iconic, in fact, that, you know, when you see the F-14 in YouTube videos, they always play that Kenny Loggins Highway to the Danger Zone song because the airplane is like con conceived and, and intertwined with 80s pop culture. I mean, it's just, it's an icon, okay? You play a game with an F-14 in it and everybody's like, oh, Highway to the Danger Zone. You know, it's, it's just a pop culture thing. So the thought of that whole thing not even happening if a certain Shah of Iran hadn't made a phone call to his state bank it's kind of trippy. At least it's trippy to me. Maybe some, maybe more cultured individuals will find that, you know, perfectly logical. But I think it's just funny that so many Americans who are gung-ho patriotic, you know, gung-ho patriotic to the point of, you know, they think about Iran and it's always about negative stuff, right? Always about the hostage crisis and all those things. The same people who would throw rocks at Iran as a country because of the various political hijinks that have happened since the 1970s, I wonder how they would react to that, to the idea that, you know, hey, the only reason Tom Cruise was able to look like a tough guy in those F-14 shots is because the Iranian government basically bailed out Grumman. 
And it's, it's kind of interesting. It's a nice, it's an interesting thought. And it's something I, I it was really, I don't know. Again, maybe everyone else who has come across this fact is not surprised at it, but I was. So to think we wouldn't have an F-14 if it wasn't for Iran. So, hmm. An interesting thought that. Just, just turn that over mentally um, when you have a moment. The idea of Tom Cruise flying an F-4 in Top Gun or an F-18, like, Legacy Hornet or something. It's just, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thought. A top Gun without the F-14, that could have happened if things had just turned out a little bit differently, if they had decided to, say, buy F-15s. Uh, you know, this video might not even exist. I'd be probably filming something else right now. So it's an interesting thought, the idea that Iran saved the program, but they did, and... Um, as a result of them having saved the F-14, they put the Navy in a political position to take delivery of their aircraft. And, yeah, so it's an interesting uh, interesting historical outcome of things. So after the Shah departs the uh, stage and departs his country and goes for a career change after um, some political instability in Iran, uh, the new government takes over. That government is at least publicly, um, anti-Western. We'll get to some of that a little bit later, but um, they're very anti-Western in terms of public relations and behavior, and um, right after some political unpleasantness involving the hostage crisis of 1980, um, Iran is invaded by Iraq. Uh, the way the Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein figures, Iran's military is a mess. Uh, most of the air force has either left the country or defected or... Um, you know, the Lord's been executed or shot or, you know, imprisoned, what have you. So because of all this upheaval, Saddam Hussein figures that Iran's military is in no position to fight back if he invades, so he does. And it turns into a 10-year-long war that a lot of Americans have no idea even happened. Um, but it was a big cultural event. And during that war, the F-14 was such a high-performing aircraft in Iranian service that the Iraqis considered it to be a strategic asset to shoot them down. Um, so to understand just how impactful it was, we need to look at some things. Um, during the Iran-Iraq war, Iran obviously flew the F-14s. Uh, Iraq had at MiG-23s and MiG-21s at the start of the war. This is what changed as it went on, but at the beginning, they had Soviet export versions of these MiGs, and the export versions of the Soviet MiGs were a bit decontented compared to the Soviet version. The Soviet versions had BVR missiles, um, relatively, for the culture of the Soviet Union, advanced BVR uh, technology. They had um, radar warning receivers, infrared sights, um, you know, kind of those kind of electronic necessities of modern aerial combat. Um, so the Russian aircraft had those features. Certain chosen Warsaw Pact allies had those features. Iraq was not on that list. So the aircraft they got were MiG-23s that had um, one generation behind radar, infrared only short range missiles, and no radar warning receivers this would turn into a bit of a problem because the F-14 obviously is substantially more advanced than those export grade MiGs and it shows. Um, so to illustrate kind of the, the damage of this, basically what they would do is um, the Iranians would launch the F-14s and the F-14s would have the Phoenix missile, which obviously had a long uh, reach in terms of radar coverage and range. And further, um, the radar in the F-14 has, of course, multiple uh, search and track capabilities, and, um, you know, it was the most sophisticated air, airborne radar, you know, fighter jet ever launched at that point in time, and they were going up against MiGs that had, in the case of, like, the MiG-21s, I don't even think they had a radar that was beyond range only, like, for gun sighting, and the radar in their MiG-23s were essentially, um, just short range only, so, these aircraft, these MiGs at the Iraqi sortie were completely not up to par in terms of being able to fight F-14s and the kill ratios show that. Um, allegedly, one story holds from Tom Cooper's excellent book about Iranian F-14s in combat. Um, he apparently verified this, that one F-14 launched AIM-54 shot down three MiGs at the same time because 
the debris from the first airplane being destroyed went into the next airplane, which caused it to fall apart. And then the debris from that airplane hit the next one. And this chain reaction process meant that one missile shot down three MiG-23s. Um, and, and the way the Iraqis would generally end up knowing they were being engaged by a Tomcat is when they would get hit with a missile or blown out of the sky. Because no radar warning receiver, no um, radar of any practical use, no beyond visual range capability. And if their ground control connections were jammed, they were basically visual only. And they were going up against an F-14 with the most advanced radar ever put in a fighter at the time. So uh, SEAL clubbing is, that's a gamer term, but I think it pretty much fits the situation at the beginning of the Iran-Iraq war. The F-14s had all the advantages and the MiGs had none. And to even, to add insult to injury to the situation, not only that the F-14 had superior technological capability, the pilots also had superior training because they were trained by F-14 pilots who probably came from F-4s in the Navy, in the U.S. Navy, and probably some of them had Vietnam and Top Gun experience under their belt. So we're talking people trained by the best of the best in the world, flying the best electronically capable airplanes ever built in that generation against aircraft at least one generation behind with only a fraction of the training. The kill ratios are just even if you look at the conservative kill ratios, the Iraqis themselves admit that the F-14s knocked down a lot of their aircraft. Um, between 12 and something like 20 MiG-23s were shot down by these F-14s, and the most that they lost were three. And those three happened later in the war when the Iraqis got fed up with the Soviet Union and went to the French to secure orders for the Mirage. And the French took advantage of the opportunity, sold the Iraqis, I think the Mirage F-1, let me look at the notes here, Mirage F-1 EQ. And that aircraft, of course, had much more modern radar warning receivers and radars and uh, BVR capability and all that. And the Iraqis were able to use those aircraft to take down a couple of Tomcats before the ceasefire was um, agreed upon. So... Uh, yeah, this aircraft has a lot of tactical importance to Iran, and um, even now, it's still in service with that country. So, um, yeah, and it's it's a question of, I, I'm not sure how long they're going to keep flying these things. Uh, it's going on 50 years, uh, since 1970, you know, 1974, and they're still flying them now. So... It's interesting that they've chosen to keep them, and I think part of the reason why, as just a layman on the outside, is they have control over keeping them flying. Um, when we sold the F-14s as a country to Iran, uh, America also sold um, logistics support, local maintenance, local construction of engine maintenance facilities, um, you know, component manufacturing, all that. Um, when the F-14s were sold to Iran, it wasn't just a matter of selling the aircraft. The logistics and the local infrastructure and all that were also built so that Iran could support and maintain these aircraft locally. Now, of course, that stuff wasn't intended to be used because Iran was now a geopolitical enemy, right? Um, all those resources were designed so that the local economy of Iran would be improved by the aircraft. And, you know, every time the Iranian military had a maintenance issue with the aircraft, they didn't have to fly them all the way back to the United States across a 6,000 mile trip to fix it, right? So the logistics were designed to just make it so that Iran could independently fix their aircraft, um, which, you know, 50 something years later has proven to be a resounding success, right? So when people look at documents and reports that say that they weren't flying or that Iran, you know, couldn't maintain them or whatever. They're ignoring the fact that um, the U.S. government uh, and Grumman and those organizations spent a lot of money and sent a lot of people to Iran to locally maintain, service, and train um, the, the locals in terms of that country to maintain this aircraft. So not only was it a military resource, it was also an economic and technological one, too. So um, this is... The practical reason behind how Iran was able to keep these things flying and why they can still do it now. 
So the reason I mention that in terms of what could replace it is because, well, if they buy airplanes from any other country, they're not going to give them the same deal. Um, because right now, Iran has a local industry to sustain and support these aircraft, and that industry is theirs. That's their native culture and their native political priority. Um, whereas if they buy, say, Russian aircraft, well, the Russian aircraft, any deep maintenance on that has to be done back in the home country. And that would be the deal with just about any airplane they could order, which they can't order anyway because of sanctions. So, you know, it's, it's a complicated question in terms of could they replace it? And if they could replace it, would they want to? Because whatever airplane they replace this with, they also probably would want to be able to work on locally too. And I don't think there's any country out there that would do that for them and would be willing to go around the UN sanctions too. So we may be seeing these aircraft flying in Iran for a very long time to come for all those reasons. So I mean, it's good because thanks to YouTube, us Westerners can still see them fly. So kind of nice to look at that. Um, so with all that history kind of recounted, let's get to the nuts and bolts of this guy, which is comparing the two models here. Um, so right now, the Caliber Wings version right here in the back this guy is currently on sale for about $150 on Caliber Wings' website. Um, at the time of this video, by the time you see this, um, uh, it may be completely sold out. I predict it probably will because it is a very good model. Um, the Hobby Master is also for sale. However, uh, at this point, this has been out for some time. So you may, at, right now, you probably have to go to a couple of you know, hard to find outlets to find it. The latest price I was able to find on this guy was about 170 something dollars because he's, you know, uh, I think for a long time, this was pretty much the only Iranian F-14 172nd scale die cast model you could buy. So the prices are high and it is actually a really good looking model. Um, so let me just start off in, before comparing the models by stating that at first I thought the Caliber was going to basically mop the floor with this. I thought, hey, Hobby Master's been out for a while. Caliber's bringing some new um, quality and new design and tolerances and all that to the game. I figured it was going to be a walkover in favor of the, the Caliber. But in point of fact, the two models are very close in terms of quality and overall um, look and feel and fitness and kind of those things. Um, so as you probably can tell from the montage footage I rolled earlier, these things are, both of these aircraft look really nice. And honestly, it, it, I, I figured it was going to be an easier comparison than it was. It, it's tough. It's tough to just pick one and say this one is better and that one isn't. Um, because they're both good and they're both lacking in just different ways. And when you add it all up, it's kind of a wash. Um, case in point, um, when you look at the, um, look at the canopy, for example, the canopy height on the, um, on this guy right here on the Hobby Master, it's closer to the actual aircraft than the little bit higher. It's got a little bit of an exaggerated bow here. It should be a little bit flatter, but then the canopy windscreen is better on the caliber because it's one piece molded versus the Hobby Master where it's applied on the nose. So... Uh, is, is the canopy of each one really better? No, they're, they're both good. They're just in different ways. Uh, same deal with the cannon. The cannon on the Hobby Master is uh, fairly detailed. You have printing, or not printing, excuse me, you have molding in the cannon vents. This is molded into the metal on the model, which is really nice. And the cannon is nice and prominent. Um, the, the housing, the, the, the vent for the cannon where the bullets obviously come out, it's very nicely done. On the caliber, that area is a lot shallower, a lot a little smaller, and the, the vents are printed. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's six in one hand and a half a dozen in the other. I mean, it's the details on both are really good. Um, the caliber comes with a wash on the landing gear. The landing gear on that guy is... Um, they have a little bit of oil wash, which makes it look a little bit aged or, or worn, which I, I don't know. Uh, I'm a little conflicted when it comes to factory weathering of various parts. Um, I, I think that's something that really should be up to the customer to decide because there is no standard for realistic um, wear or realistic weathering. Um, 
So some people have a different idea of what that is. And for the manufacturer to try to guesstimate what that's going to be is a bit tough. So uh, I think it looks good, but it's something that I'm not necessarily passionate about in either. Um, so that's take it or leave it thing. So maybe you can say that the landing gear is a little bit better. But then when you look at like the wingtips here with the uh, anti-collision lights and the formation lights here, uh, there's more detail on the wingtip on the Hobbymaster than there is on the Caliber. Um, there's also more detail on the back here, kind of in this area, um, with the um, the connections and the engine maintenance hatches and all that. There's more detail down here in terms of molding and distinctness of the molding uh, on this part of the aircraft than there is in the equivalent region on the Caliber. So. I mean, it, it's it's a trade-off. It really is. Um, both of them look really nice, um, and both of them have different kinds of flaws. I mean, the, the caliber, you get... Um, the, the nozzles on the caliber are interchangeable. You can take these off uh, and put bigger ones so that you can show the airplane in full afterburner or not. With the Hobbymaster, you just get the engines in the um, military power setting here. Uh, so... Is that a is that a boon? I don't know. I say I don't know because as nice as it is to change the nozzles, the tolerances on the nozzles with the caliber wings are kind of loose. So I'm not even going to touch it because if I did, it's just going to fall off. Which brings me to the next point, um, which is that the caliber you do get more combination of missiles on the Hobbymaster. You get the AIM-7 and the AIM-9. You get a pair of those on a pylon. And then you get four pylons that go underneath in the middle, which have your pallets for the phoenixes, of which you get four in the box. And that's it. The caliber, you get a um, you get that combination plus two phoenixes plus an extra pair of pylons and pylon mounting points. So you can run a six phoenix setup on the caliber wings over here if you want to. Unfortunately, I can't put that down as an overall positive because the tolerances on the caliber wing are kind of loose. Um, definitely going to need to do some glue if you want to put stuff like that on the aircraft, which is why I have not put phoenixes on the caliber because once you do, it's kind of a one-way street. There's no taking them off later and deciding you want to show it in kind of this way because the fit is so... Um, Inconsistent. Some parts on the caliber fit really nicely. Some parts just fall off really quickly, like the engine nozzle I mentioned earlier. And some parts are like both. I've, I've had on my F-14 that I did a review on earlier, the Top Gun one, um, the camera pod, it fits in the front post, but it doesn't fit in the back post. I mean, it's caliber's tolerances in terms of their accessories are a bit wonky. And it's something I hope they work on down the line. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a deal breaker, but I would rather have accessories that I can put on and take off like the Hobby Master and not worry about it than with the caliber where I have to break out glue and then basically put it together like a model kit because the accessory fits just too inconsistent on certain parts. So, hmm, I mean, in terms of quality and overall look and, and feel, I mean, you can tell from the video just from what you've seen to this point, both of them are really good models. So at this, I can't really make the decision for you and say which one's better. Um, so I just know personally, I'm very grateful to have both of these in my collection. I'm glad to have both as display items uh, in my collection. I'm glad to be in a position where I can afford to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful that I don't have to choose because this, if I had to, this would, this would be very tough. I'd almost have to go flip a coin because they are both really, really good models. And, uh, yeah, uh, I, I could keep talking, but if you just watch the montage footage and watch the way these two look next to each other, you can probably get what I'm saying. It's just, they're, re they're both really good models. And, this isn't something that I can sit down and say that, well, you know, Model X is definitively better than Model Y. I mean, it's, they're, they're both good. So um, I'm glad to have both in the collection. I'm glad to have a little piece of the Iranian F-14 story on my shelf. And um, hopefully you feel the same. 
So I'm going to take a moment and gently remind you to please leave some feedback on what you've seen to this point. Uh, let me know how I'm doing. If you liked the video, um, click the like button and the subscribe if you want to see more. Uh, I'll try to stick to a once a month schedule. Sometimes things get in the way, but that's what I'm looking to do. So coming down the line on some videos I plan on doing, uh, I'm gonna be looking at some British aircraft, uh, be hopefully getting the next video will be either about the Tornado GR1 or the Jaguar GR1. Just It just depends on the schedule and what I can do in terms of research and looking up things and researching material and taking the time to take notes and put things together. Um, as I've shown in this video, there's always something new when I do that. I always learn something different about airplanes. and um, Well, let's put it like this. Sometimes the common narrative about what happens with aircraft is different than what the truth happens to actually be when you open some books and do some actual research on it. So um, if nothing else, that lesson has been thoroughly reinforced over the last four videos that I have done to this point. So um, I'm going to be putting out some videos about those. And then after some of the British aircraft, I might be doing one on the F-101 Voodoo. Um, so stay tuned on that. That one's going to be a very complicated story, just like this one. It might actually be even more complicated because the Voodoo the F-101 is basically like four airplanes combined into one story, and talking about that is going to involve some Christopher Nolan-style time-shifting logic to that tale. It's going to be weird. I, I already tried to research it, and it was like, wow, there's a lot. There's a lot of history going on there. And just like the Iranian F-14, a lot of it is unknown to Western audiences, so probably going to be some questions on that one. But um, yeah, those are the ones I have coming down the pike immediately in, in the next couple of months. Um, I, as you can probably tell from the background, I've got plenty of aircraft to look at. So um, I'm just going to go down one by one or two by two as it is today and uh, talk through the history and show them off a bit and kind of share the joy of um, sharing the stories about how they came to be and, and the human impact of these models. So. Thank you again for watching to uh, this point and I hope to you to have you enjoy further videos down the line and the ones in the collection now. Thanks for tuning in.